This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Ranking Michigan's 2022 football opponents from easiest to hardest and more on a jam-packed edition of Michigan Podcast next. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it, Nick Cook. They said you can't do Ohio State. Now what? Brady gets terrific. Closer, get it, touchdown night again. Schultz, just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue. I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to another edition of Michigan Podcast. The season is nigh. We're just a few weeks away from kickoff for the 2022 Michigan football season. And we've got a jam-packed show here today. Uh, I think this might be the first time we've ever had double guests on the program. Mark Rogers uh, will join us for the 10-minute war, as he typically does. But our old pal, Brett Ciancia, from Pick 6 Previews. He will be joining us uh, in the program as well. Uh, Arguably the most accurate prediction publication the last several seasons of college football. He'll gaze into his crystal ball and tell us us what he's got in store, what he thinks happens in terms of both the playoff and where he sees the Wolverines finishing this season. And, and that's where we're going to open up the program here today, looking at Michigan's football schedule and ranking the Wolverines' opponents from easiest to hardest as we go one by one all the way through 12 games. Let's start with what I think is the easiest opponent, and that would be Hawaii. There you've got a new coach who's not just a new coach. He's a rookie coach, period. A former Hawaii quarterback, Timmy Chang, is taking over the program. They've lost quite a bit. Uh, and, and, and so you're in transition with a coach that uh, has never coached before. You're coming across the mainland. Uh, the last time I was at a Michigan game in person, I'm going to go to the Nebraska game later this year, looking forward to it. But the last time I was at a Michigan game in person was the season opener against Hawaii in 2016 when the when the Rainbows had to come across and play a game that was like a kickoff at like 7 a.m. local time. And Michigan won that game 63-3. to I think you could be looking at a similar outcome here uh, in what's a bad spot for probably a bad Hawaii team to open the season. My next most difficult game is UConn. Now, you've got the former UCLA coach there. Uh, They should be more competent. They should be more professional than what we've seen the last couple of seasons, but you're still talking about a very talent-anemic roster. Uh, I don't know that there is a single player on the two-deep at UConn that would make the two-deep at Michigan, like even as a backup. So this is another name the score Saturday for the Wolverines. Continuing on that trend, (laughs) it's the non-conference, guys. This might be the biggest uh, cream puff non-conference I can remember Michigan playing my entire life, and I'm all for it. 
right? We watch all these SEC teams play Lamar Tech, you know, right before rivalry weekend. Nobody punishes them for it. So load up the cream puffs because Lord knows there's enough tough competition in the Big Ten. Michigan opens the season against Colorado State. And, and a new coach there for Colorado State as well, except they're bringing in a guy uh, that has had some success, did a phenomenal job rebuilding the Nevada program, knows the Big Ten. Jay Norvell played at the University of Iowa, but he's also taking over a roster that's very much in flux. It's the season opening game. Uh, I expect Michigan to roll here as well against the Rams. Finally, we get into Big Ten play. My number nine ranked game on Michigan's schedule is Rutgers. I have Rutgers, my power ratings say they will definitely take a drop on the defensive side. Will definitely be one of the worst offenses that Michigan plays this year. So uh, even though this game is in Piscataway, which you always like to be able to say that, this should be, yet again, a common refrain. There's going to be a lot of these, both because of how soft this schedule is and how good this team is. Another name your score Saturday for the Wolverines. Number eight on my list is at Indiana. Now, this has been a program that even when it's not been good, for whatever reason, has given Michigan fits here uh, in the last decade or so, going back to the Rich Rod era. They just seem to play their best against Michigan. Even last year's game, when they were completely overmatched, playing a freshman quarterback in his first start on the road at night at Michigan Stadium, they still played very hard. Now, they, they still presented some pass rush, fit, pass rush fits, easy for me to say, some pass rush fits that still gave Michigan's offensive line fits in a year when it won the Joe Moore Award. They just were overwhelmed from a talent standpoint. I expect them to play hard. I expect them to be better than they were a year ago when this was maybe the most injury-riddled team in our entire conference, but I also expect Michigan here to win fairly conv- uh, convincingly. Number eight uh, on my list is, or seven, I should say, is Illinois at home. Yeah, it, it's a fascinating time in the schedule. You know, Michigan's going to have a, a slew of these tough games at the end of the year. It's a back-loaded schedule, then kind of like right in the middle of it is Illinois and uh, Brett Bielema, who obviously knows how to come into Michigan Stadium and win. I just think that this is the year they take kind of a dip. They were surprisingly uh, competitive last year in Bielema's first year. They had more fifth-year COVID and COVID seniors than any team in our league. They lost a lot. They lost a bunch of those guys. This is a roster that's very much in flux. And, and and I think they take a dip this year before maybe taking a step forward next year. Expect Michigan to roll. Number six on this list is Michigan's Big Ten opener. And even in years when Michigan football was struggling, did not often lose Big Ten openers, Maryland will present some problems for the Wolverines. Uh, assuming that it can finally keep all those receivers healthy, it struggled to do that last year. Maryland just seems to always have injury problems. Uh, I expect that they will give Michigan's young secondary uh, some problems in that Big Ten opener especially when it should barely be challenged the first few weeks of the year against Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn. But Maryland's defense is absolutely atrocious. Some of the worst talent and depth numbers that in my power ratings in the entire Big Ten Conference. I could see Maryland putting up 24, 28, maybe even 31 points and giving up 52, 56, maybe more. Similar to the game we saw last year, Uh, at College Park that was kind of Donovan Edwards' break uh, party, uh, if you will. Uh, So I think Michigan takes a punch or two, but still dominates for the most part here, as it has really the entire Harbaugh era against the Terps. All right, now we get into the tougher portion of the schedule. This will be a, this is this will be a controversial choice to some, and is not intended to be a troll. But I have Michigan State only the fifth most difficult game on the schedule for three reasons. Number one. Uh, it's a double revenge match for the Wolverines. They they know. Uh, Harbaugh knows. The program knows. You can hear this from some of the players, their comments uh, in Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. They know they have to win this game. They, they, they know that. They know they cannot allow Mel Tucker to punk them for a third time in a row, especially for a second time in a row in their own stadium. That's number one. So you have a double revenge angle. Number two, it is in their own stadium. They have not played Michigan State at home in their own stadium in front of fans since 2019. Uh, This will be the biggest home game on the schedule this year with Ohio State on the road. So that environment, I think, will be a huge advantage for the Wolverines. And then on top of that, I think Michigan State had a phenomenal year last year. Shouldn't take anything away from them. They beat us. Uh, It was our only regular season loss, although 
there was some controversy in that game, of course, but they beat us, won 11 games, won a New Year's Six Bowl game. That is legit. But they did pull out a lot of games last year. You know, we don't have a Ken Palm luck factor in football like we do in uh, in college basketball. But if you can look at it, you know, win expectancy and several of the games that Michigan State won last year, you'd get down to the last couple of minutes and their win expectancy was sub 50 percent. I just think after a while that tends to regress to the mean a little bit. This will still be a very good football team. Uh, I think it'll be, probably be more of a 7-9 to nine win team than a 10-11 to 11 win team as it was a year ago. And so for those three reasons, a bit of a step back for Michigan State, the situation and the desperation and redemption and urgency being on the side of the Wolverines, uh, and then also where the game is being played, I think those three things weigh heavily into Michigan's favor. And that's why I had this game, I guess we'll say, only rated the fifth most toughest game on the schedule. Number four on my list is Nebraska. And don't forget how tough the Huskers played us last year at night in Lincoln. Uh, And and there's another problem here in this game. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to it. All right. And going back to the first time I ever went to a Michigan game in 1986 against Minnesota, we were number two in the country. We lost at home to a six and five Minnesota team coached by Lou Holtz. That game probably got him the Notre Dame job. Uh, And that was 1985, I should say. And uh, losing that game, no, yeah, it was uh, 1986, actually. So Holtz was already at Notre Dame. I forget, we lost to John Goodigenst. We didn't even lose to Lou Holtz. That makes it even more pathetic. Wow, that's even more terrible than I remembered. Ricky Foggy was the quarterback. Chip Low Miller, I think, had 75 field goals in that game, went on to a good career in the NFL. Just a, I was 13, man. I was devastated after that game, a devastating loss. And it's been a mixed bag, you know? Uh, it's been a mixed bag when uh, when I go to, to Michigan games. So that's the number one reason I have this rated one of the top five toughest games on the schedule is I'm going to be there, which, you know, that's a handicap for the Wolverines. Number three on my list, Penn State. You know, Penn State has uh, had won the last time at Michigan Stadium. Remember, that was in the COVID year with nobody there and what was not a good look and not a good loss for the Wolverines. Uh, Penn State is just 11-11 and 11 the last two years, but they they recruit at Michigan's level. And you got to think that maybe they're the team, like Michigan was last year, that comes into this season with the giant chip on its shoulder and something to prove with its program being doubted. And, and so because they're one of the few teams on Michigan's schedule this year that I think can physically stand up to them. That's why they're the third toughest game on the schedule for me. Number two is Iowa. And this is really just all about the location. Um, Michigan has not won a game ever at Kinnick Stadium with Jim Harbaugh either as the coach or the quarterback. Think about that. I mean, he played on two of Bo's best teams uh, and at the end of Bo's career. He's had a pretty good, not great until last year, but a pretty good coaching career at Michigan. And as a player or a coach, he has never won a game at Kinnick Stadium. In fact, I'm going back trying to remember the last time uh, Michigan won a game at Kinnick Stadium. And I'm, I'm going back. I mean, I think we're going back like pre-Rich Rod at this point. Um, it's, been a, it's been a minute. It's a difficult place to play. Now, I do think there's some good news. This kind of reminds me of the game at Wisconsin last year in almost the exact same spot in the season. First game on the road, early October, a place Michigan doesn't win a lot that has a tremendous home field advantage. And Michigan was, you know, we're all as Michigan fans like, man, I don't want to play a night game at Camp Randall. Then you found out it was the Fox Big Noon Sunday game and you're like, not saying it's still going to be easy to go in there and win, but that at least takes a field goal, if not more off the point spread. Well, the signs are pointing to this not being a night game. At Kinnick Stadium, if you look at the rest of the Big Ten slate that weekend, this is the clear favorite, especially if Iowa beats Iowa State, as it's done uh, a lot uh, the last few years under Kirk Ferentz. Both of these teams undefeated, maybe both in the top 10. If you look at the rest of the slate of the Big Ten that week, this would be the leader in the clubhouse uh, for the Fox Big Noon Sunday. Trust me, as a guy that's been to lots of games at Kinnick, used to cover the Iowa Hawkeyes professionally, uh, went and actually went to the Iowa-Michigan game in 2011 at Kinnick Stadium. Uh, That was Brady Hoke's great year with the Sugar Bowl and the 11 wins and everything else. Lost a game at Iowa City. You would rather, you would much rather play a game in Iowa City at 11 a.m. than you would at 7 o'clock. Now, it ain't easy at 11 a.m. 
but you would much rather play at 11 a.m. than 7 o'clock. But still, that has been a house of horrors for the Wolverines, which is why it's my second toughest game on the schedule. Which, of course, brings us to number one, and it's obvious. The game at Ohio State. And it's been quite a while since the Buckeyes have come back home licking their wounds, hosting the Wolverines after losing a game to Michigan anywhere, let alone in the big house. And the Wolverines have not won in the shoe since 2000. Just to show you how long ago that was, that game was interrupted by news reports about the ongoing controversy over the Florida recount in the 2000 presidential election. That's how long ago that was. Is this finally the Michigan team to get it done. We shall see, but until they do, you have to rate it the toughest game on Michigan's schedule and by far, and that's before we even get into the fact the Buckeyes are going to return another star-studded and talented offense this year. Well, speaking of Buckeyes, let's find out what uh, our friendly Buckeye, Mark Rogers, has to say about this and more next. Yes, folks, uh, we get asked a lot, hey, what can we do to support what you're doing here at Michigan Podcast? We can always like, rate, subscribe, share the content, but you can also uh, share uh, with us by supporting us on our Patreon page. There you can see we've had an outstanding season so far uh, with Major League Baseball picks uh, all year long. We've got win totals posted uh, for college football for every college football team uh, already posted, uh, what, two months ago now, my season win total best bets for the season as well with the season nigh you'll be getting weekly picks and more for both college and pro football we'll finish baseball strong you don't want to miss it college basketball is only about 100 days away just five bucks a month if you want to support us to get all this great exclusive content on our patreon page at patreon.com slash michigan podcast that's patreon dot com slash Michigan podcast. And as all as always, we want to thank the hundreds of you that are already supporting us there at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. All right, let's get to it. Time for the 10 minute war with our friendly neighborhood and perhaps only reasonable buck nut friend and fan, Mark Rogers, who of course has a tremendous channel covering college football here on YouTube, the voice of college football. They've got channels and correspondents set up for pretty much every top program in the country. Great sources of information, particularly during the time of year when maybe for, of course, just purely entertainment and informational purposes, you might be looking to get ahead of the market with little nuggets of information. It can be a quite, shall we say, profitable experience. Mark, good to see you again, my friend. How are you? I am doing well, Steve. Good to see you as well. We are just a few weeks away from football. We are just a few weeks away from football. I was just laying out how I rated Michigan's schedule, and I want to get your, from you know easiest game to hardest, I want to get a few big picture takes from you. Number one, I think this could very well be the softest non-conference schedule that Michigan has played ever, like in the history of the program, um, since at least I've been a fan um, and, and maybe they had softer schedules like in the seventies, but it just seemed that way because you had, you know, Michigan and Ohio state had 105 scholarships and could compile a lot more depth and there was no transfer portal. And so it wasn't necessarily that teams like Cal and, and UCLA were that bad. They were just getting rolled by superior rosters. And so it looked like it's a, a Charmin schedule. This is a Charmin soft non-schedule, uh, non-conference schedule. And in this era where, Hey, all that matters is how many games at the end of the year you win, it seems. I, I have no problem with it whatsoever, but what do you think? Well, once uh, programs in the Big Ten started to catch up in the early 80s, Iowa started to contend for Big Ten championships, Illinois, Michigan State, and a few others. Yes, I would have to agree that uh, I always admired uh, Michigan's ability to go out there or their 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 desire to go out there and schedule difficult non-conference games. Okay, this, Wow. Uh, You always hear the phrase thrown around when reviewing uh, scheduling non-conference games that, well, these teams got together five years in advance and nobody knew how good that team was going to be. Right, right, right. Well, no, we we know (laughs) what Colorado State, Hawaii, and especially UConn are going to deliver, whether it be in 2022 or 2032 or 42. Uh, It is (laughs) Awful not conference schedule. Uh, there is a situation right with UCLA that there was a game schedule between the Wolverines and the Bruins that was canceled, correct? Yes. That yeah. resulted in yeah, non-conference yeah. for not only Michigan, but for UCLA, which correct. 
may even be even worse than what we see. Yeah, from UCLA's non conference is uh, that's scheduling for a bowl game, uh, is what that is. Yes, no doubt about it. Yeah, it, it the Baylor NC State route to uh, getting to six or seven wins. Absolutely. Um, I, it just sets up favorably not only in the non conference to build up the wins to make this. The, the ranking look good and the record look good for the ranking. And, of course, Michigan starting at number six in the coaches poll. And uh, that's typically indicative of, of course, the AP poll and then the college football playoff selection committee and what they're going to view. So it sets up nicely from that standpoint. But also in the Big Ten schedule, right. uh, if you got nine games, you're, you're either going to play four at home or five on the road, and it goes every other year. So that sets up with a five at home. And most of the difficult games at home, Nebraska, Michigan State, Penn State at home. And then the bye, I noticed, between Michigan State and Penn State, good deal there Mm -hmm. for Michigan to go down the home stretch of the season with the bye to prepare for another difficult game with that extra week off. Uh, The one thing that a non-conference slate like this may not serve well, though, Steve, is preparing the younger portion of the roster for the date at Iowa. So for those players that didn't play meaningful snaps and meaningful games last year, but may be counted upon at at some degree this year, going into a hornet's nest at Kinnick Stadium uh, in week five, correct, after Maryland uh, comes to town, uh, may not serve them well in not playing at least a reasonably difficult one opponent in the non-conference, a Kansas State, uh, you know, a Wake Forest, some somebody of mid-level, mid-tier sure. uh, difficulty in one of the Power Five, uh, the other leagues. I think might have served this this roster uh, a little bit better, but that's about the only possible. And that's but as I just scan through the roster in my head, I can't think of a lot of guys that are going to play meaningfully right. for Michigan this year that did not play anything meaningful last year. Because as I have been telling you for nine months, contrary to Ohio State Twitterdom, we did not have an entire roster of ninth-year COVID seniors last year, and and Aiden Hutchinson went to the NFL. The vast majority of last year's team is actually coming back. It's just the few guys we lost were all real impact players, but there's, there's not that many guys this year that will be counted on heavily that did not play great minutes. And I, I would also flip the script on that, in that... This is an excellent way to keep guys engaged and not grousing about playing time or I'm being, you know, I'm being re-recruited. You promised me this to get me to sign. And now you're telling, you know, the reality sets in of being in college um, is those early games, man, we're going to empty the bench in a lot and, and every single week in those games. And that's a great way to build some esprit de corps for later when you've got to tighten the rotation when you are playing your tougher conference games. But those guys got a taste in the action. They got some development early on uh, and some instant sort of affirmation after you know their first difficult college camp. I think that that can, that can actually play well uh, when it comes to preserving players. Like there's this notion that I, that I think everybody expects that Michigan's going to come out and do what it did last year in the non-conference. Just run the ball like 50, 60 times. I don't think we're going to do that, actually. And the reason I think we're, I don't think we're going to do that is, is, is twofold. Number one, Donovan Edwards and Blake Corm are both far more dynamic runners than Hassan Haskins, but they're not the, they're not the same kind of durability. They're not battering ram guys. And you want, you want those legs to be, to be, uh, you want them, you want a little low tread, as low tread on those tires as you can. You want those legs fresh for later in the year when the games that we were just talking about take place, right? So what is the point of running them into the line 20 times against UConn? I don't believe they're going to do that. The other reason is, is because they've got, they've got the most talent, uh, in the receiver room at Michigan than they've had since, you know, when they had Breston, Braylon, uh, and Jason Avant, they might not have a guy that's that good, but in terms of the depth, they've never had this much of a room. And those guys do complain when they don't get the ball for a long time, right? And so that's that's one thing. When you might go into Iowa City and you might play this a little bit more closer to the vest in that environment and not sling it all over the field against a secondary at Iowa that pretty much leads the league or is up there in the Big Ten in interceptions every year. And so you, you, you kind of 
uh, make nice deposits in those guys' accounts in those first three games. And you let a Ronnie Bell get ten catches against UConn coming off a knee injury. You let a you let some you let some guys get two or three or you let those quarterbacks get two or three touchdown uh, receptions apiece. It pro, it both saves those uh, running backs those star backs but then also you know gives those uh, receivers a little uh, of the face time and the camera time that they desire so that later in the year when things get a little bit more physical in the big 10 you know they're more on board your thoughts on that well i think you've hit all the key points that uh, play into preparing the team physically but also keeping the psyches in check yes we know that receivers are sometimes a bit different than everybody else on the field so your point to keeping everybody else involved by just getting them snaps the receivers that get snaps and run pass routes or just run down the field five or seven yards while you're running the ball between the tackles Mm -hmm. aren't satisfied with those snaps so throw them the football get them three to four and like you say even though there are not necessarily those high high extremely high end guys it's a Pretty impressive receiver room from a depth standpoint. Keep those guys involved. Throw them the ball two or three times against the likes of UConn, Colorado State, and Hawaii. And yeah, Hassan Haskins, battering Ram, but Corum, Edwards, keep them, keep them fresh, keep them healthy. You know, go Tom Landry, Tony Dorsett. We know that you're not happy with this, but 15 to 18 carries for the season, and then we'll be ready for you to. Um, to run the football against uh, Penn State, Ohio State, and those teams. They'll probably Absolutely. also have an ongoing quarterback competition, Mark. That's the other reason why I don't think they're going to run the ball 60 times. Is I think I think what they will do is, uh, is just say it's too close to call. Kate will get voted captain by his teammates, more than likely. And, and so they'll give him the starting nod. But I think that they will play this thing out. They will treat those three games from a quarterback position like preseason games. Uh, and And... They will they will make a determination who the permanent starter is in those games, and you're not going to do that running the ball 60 times. So I think when you look at all three of those situations, I, I think you're going to see them actually throw a lot more in those early games than what we saw last year. More moving parts in the passing game that have to be worked on rep after rep after rep against competition. We'll we'll just say that live live competition. Uh, I think pays dividends more down the road than it does running the football, even though those reps are valuable uh, for everybody involved, but not as many moving parts that have to be coordinated between line, quarterback, receivers, timing, all of that. But again, at the same time, I was thinking the same thing early in 21, and I thought that they were going to open it up a little bit for a quarterback competition. And then also knowing that, hey, we know who Haskins is, Let's uh, prepare this team for down the road, but it all worked out. Finally, what do you think is the second toughest game on Michigan's schedule? Obviously, Ohio State stands apart given the personnel that it has on a perennial basis and the fact Michigan has not won there since ABC was breaking into the game to give us updates on the Florida recount. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> all right. That was Drew the Drew Henson game in 2000. Okay. So, I mean, I think it was, I think it was Drew Henson versus Steve Belisari. I think was the quarterback battle that day. Yep. And and obviously Drew Henson was going to win that eventually, and he did. That's the last time we went into the horseshoe and came out with a W. And that was, I think, that season in three teams. I think Michigan, Purdue, and Northwestern tied for the Big Ten Championship. That was the Drew Brees year uh, at Purdue when they went to the Rose Bowl. So, I mean, that just shows, shows everybody how long it's been since Michigan has won that game on, you know, on the road wearing a white uniform. So that clearly is number one. I think at Iowa is number two, even though all signs are now that they're going to escape playing them at night like we did Wisconsin last year, which was kind of a subtle you know, advantage that Michigan got early on. It's never easy to play at Camp Randall, but you'd much rather play there at 11 a.m. local than 7 o'clock, right? Same thing with Kinnick, but I still think given the history, Jim Harbaugh, either as a player or a coach, has never won a game at Kinnick Stadium. And so I have that as the second hardest game on Michigan's schedule, Mark, but what do you think? I think you're bringing up bad memories of Ohio State having equal to or better rosters than the likes of Purdue, but facing Drew Brees with Steve Belisari, who (laughs) somehow held down the starting quarterback job for three seasons at Ohio State, 99-2001. Okay, get that out of my head, mediocre Ohio State football teams. Okay, Penn State. I'm going to go with Penn State still. I just believe Sean Clifford, with all the criticism, uh, I think that he has proven more so in this past season to be a gamer, to be a baller, to be a tough leader. Uh, 
Iowa, yes, from a environment standpoint and the timing of the game, the Iowa game stands out because of the history and because we know how difficult it is to go into Kinnick and somehow they find just enough offense to put pressure on the likes of Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. All three of those teams come to mind going to Kinnick in the last five or six years and coming out with L's or very, very narrow Mm -hmm. wins last second of the game. Trace McSorley to the back of the end zone kind of wins against that that Iowa crowd. Uh, But I I still have to think that Penn State, I I know that this isn't coming together as maybe their year, but um, great recruiting classes. and uh, They're one of the few teams on Michigan's schedule this year that can stand toe-to-toe with them physically, and there's not a lot of those, okay? They are one of the, they might be the only other team actually on Michigan's schedule that could do that. Uh, 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 Of course, Ohio State's in its own realm, but they might be the only other team besides the Buckeyes on Michigan's schedule that could stand up to them physically. So there's nothing wrong with picking. That was my number three game, so we weren't that far off at all. All right, good to see you as always, brother. Take care, all right? Thank you, Steve. You Appreciate bet. it. Well, we got to know our next guest here a few years ago because he has an outstanding college football preview that some estimate has been the most accurate uh, in its forecast of all the college football preview magazines and publications out there. Joined again by Brett Ciancia from Pick 6 Previews here on Michigan Podcast. Hey, Steve. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And uh, first off, congrats to your Wolverines and all the fans out there. Um, and I actually quoted you in my 2022 book, um, because after that Ohio State win, I knew right away to tune in to Michigan podcast. <laughs> you recorded it saying, uh, you know, that wasn't just a three-hour game. That was a three-hour exorcism. And uh, I thought that really summed it up yes. well the last decade, um, the last decade plus for that rivalry in Michigan football in general. So, uh, anyways, congrats to Michigan. Congrats to, to what you built over here at Michigan podcast. And thanks for having me on again. You bet, man. So tell us a little bit about Pick uh, 6 Previews and where the idea came from, how kind of your approach differs from what people are used to seeing from. Uh, there aren't too many magazines left anymore. I think it's pretty much just Athlons, Lindy's, and and Phil Steele's. I mean, there, when you and I first started having these conversations, there were still the six or seven magazines, but between the economy and technology and COVID, we're down to kind of like the three big ones now that everybody remembers. And then you have created quite a nice little niche for yourself in that space. How have you done it? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, after 10 years of going PDF digital only, I actually did add a hard copy edition this year. So I'm, I'm joining the hard copy game along with those three that you mentioned. And, um, you know, there's something to be said about the preseason preview product going back to the 1950s. Um, just a, a tangible hard copy, a book you can walk around with on the beach, on the lake, you know, you know on, on fall Saturdays at the coffee side table. Um, so I am glad to have gone physical copy this year. And and yeah, Pick 6 Previews, I launched it back in 2012 as a college football preview website. I'm a numbers guy, but I, I'm also a football guy, and I love the X's and O's of it. So I try and strike a balance between the numbers, the metrics, the analytics, but putting it back into a very readable form. And, um, you know, I'm talking to head coaches, talking to coordinators, uh, watching all the spring games I can get my hands on, and then putting this book together. It's a, it's a one-man company. It's just me. I'm doing all 66 Power 5 teams in all five leagues. And uh, it's really been a passion of mine. It's starting to take off. So, uh, and you were one of the first ones to note it too back in 2019. I appreciate that. You bet. And one of the things I love that you tried to do that I think is very difficult, and I, I, I give a lot of credit to a guy like Bill Connolly, who's now with ESPN, uh, is, is trying to figure out year in and year out. Who has that higher ceiling? You don't know because these guys, um, you know, guys come out of nowhere, right? Uh, Nobody knew Joe Burrow was going to go from, okay, SEC quarterback to arguably the greatest single season in the history of college football, right? And so you're always looking at analytics. Um, You know, I know Connolly likes to look at returning production. I created kind of my own analytic to try to look at, uh, you know, which rosters are in cycle up or cycle down years. You got your four or five teams every year that are recruiting at an elite clip. So you pretty much know they're, you know, pedal to the metal every year. But then after that, you're kind of looking to see who is cycle up, cycle down. Uh, I am anyway, from a roster potential standpoint. How do you do it, Brett? What metrics do you use? Have you created to try to figure out who are the guys that we don't know right now? Nobody knew, for example, what a David Ojabo was this time last year. Right. Nobody knew. In fact, two years ago, we weren't sure he was even going to get to play at Michigan. He was stuck back home in Scotland because of COVID and couldn't get back into the country. Okay, And so now you're Mm -hmm. talking about a guy that would have been a first round draft pick had he not blown out his Achilles at Pro Day last year. He came out of absolutely nowhere. So how do you try to figure out who are this year's David Ojabos nobody sees coming? 
Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, first off, uh, I'm a really competitive guy. And so when I found out that there was a, a, a tracking company, uh, uh, you know, an accuracy company, Stassen.com, that grades all these publications for the last 30, 40 years, uh, that meant game on for me. So I was, I was trying to find every parcel of information that I could. Um, I hit on some of them. Like I said, I'm talking to head coaches, talking to coordinators, beat writers, tuning into local radio shows, local podcasts to really get the flavor of each team um, on a team by team basis. But then, yeah, I devised my game grader formula. That's a way to, you know, look at the statistical dominance of teams and adjust it for opponent strength. I've got all kinds of numbers and, and, and metrics too. Um, but then, yeah, on the player personnel, I, you used to be able to rely more on the recruiting ranks, mm-hmm. but now with all the, the player movements and the coaching carousel, right. it, it is a lot more hectic. So you got to go really position group by position group, every team. And it sounds crazy. It is, um, but I'm competitive and I'm, I'm diving into everything. And, um, I was enough to earn the five-year accuracy title from 17 to 2021. So I'm looking to continue that. All right, let's go to this season then. There, there seems to be sort of a conventional wisdom consensus, and and I, I you know, I do my my own personal preview for fun, and I have since high school. But I do it as a projection, how I think based on metrics and numbers, um, you know, and just looking at schedules, uh, how I think the season will go. So when I put out a poll at the beginning of the year, in a, in in my own preview, it is to see it is a forecast of what I think the rankings will be when the committee meets for the final time uh, at the end of the regular season how do you amass your rankings are they a preseason power rating is it a projection is it a little bit of both i I think it's a little bit of both there um you know my my playoff my top four that's what i think the playoff will be uh come november uh you know late late november early december what the committee will announce so that's my four um it's uh it's alabama ohio state georgia and utah um so i guess that answers your question i don't think that utah would run through the pac-12 I'm sorry, would run through the SEC or run through the Big Ten. But given their schedule that, that they do have, I think they're more likely to make the playoff than an A&M or, um, or even a Michigan, which I think is really close to the higher state. But, um, but yeah, it's kind of a mix between preseason expectation and, and postseason result. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, everything goes into it. I factor in everything. Yeah, but I, the thing I actually really like that you guys do, and it's one, one of my favorite episodes each preseason is the over-under show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where you look at the win totals, the win totals over-under. And you guys, well, I know that you, you and Aaron have done this. You go through each conference, and, and you look back at the end of the year, you guys are pretty, pretty dang accurate on those. So some of you're doing is right, too, over there. Well, you mentioned Utah. I've, I've got a, a forever fond spot in my heart for the Utes because I gave them out – as a 15 to 1 wager that I made last year, and I put it on my Patreon page last year to win the Pac 12. And obviously that came through. And uh, my family uh, also has a nice fond spot in their hearts for the youths because between Utah 15 to 1 and Michigan 10 to 1 <laughs> to win the Big Ten paying off, we had a very nice vacation at Universal Studios in the dead of the Iowa winter here, uh, Brett. So that worked out pretty well. Now, my depth numbers, I, I, when, I, when I looked at Utah, I found it fascinating in that I love, I thought clearly the top line of personnel they were returning was clearly better. I mean, their offense isn't as explosive as USC's, for example. But when you look at the balance of top-line players, they're returning comprehensively on the roster. I thought they were clearly the best team uh, returning in the Pac-12. But the, but they but their depth numbers for me are low, which means that is a team that if they run into some injuries, I could see that being an issue. Now, the the good thing they have is they're not in a league that physically a lot of those teams can can physically stand up to them, right? I mean, Mario Cristobal, we thought he was building that kind of team in Oregon. They got absolutely mauled in the two times they played Utah last year. So week to week, there are not a lot of teams that can stand up to them in the trenches. There might be a team week one that can. Now they might not be as good at them everywhere else, but physically, you got to think Florida probably could stand up to uh, you know uh, them given the way they recruit in the SEC. So I'm, I, I, to me, I, I, I think the Utes are clearly the favorite in the Pac-12. But I, like a lot of other people, I think there are three teams that are virtual locks to make the playoffs. And then who that fourth team is, I think there can be a lot of variance. Um, in in my projection scenario, I actually have Michigan and Ohio State both eleven and zero when they play at the end of the regular season. And, you know, last year, the the win total I got the most wrong, one of my best bets was Michigan under its win total of eight. This year, this is the, in terms of talent, as we switch to the Wolverines, this is the most uh, talented 
and in, in terms of depth and balanced Michigan roster that I think the Wolverines have had since like, you know, the last great um, surge under Lloyd Carr from 2003 to 2006. This is the best receiver room Michigan's had since then. I think this is the best running back combination in terms of explosiveness Michigan has had since then. I think it's the best quarterback room Michigan has had since then. Uh, and, and, you start thinking, well, they lost some key guys on defense, but Harbaugh is out there doing stuff I've never seen him before. He is, he is really blowing up the expectations of this defense. He even said on a show just the other day, he thinks this would be better than last year's defense. So clearly you think the Wolverines are in that group for that fourth spot. That And and there seems to be a lot of disagreement. And you mentioned Utah and A&M. They're everybody in Michigan and Notre Dame. There's about seven or eight teams that are in contention for that fourth spot right now. Clemson's in that conversation. So why what does differentiated Utah for you because they're in that conversation with everybody too as you know Brett so for you what differentiated Utah from everybody else kind of in that who's that fourth team group yeah so um, I agree that there was three superpower teams with you know Ohio State Alabama Georgia for me that fourth spot came down to which conference of the other three is most likely to produce an undefeated or a one-loss conference champ and Mm -hmm. going through it the ACC has a lot of above average teams I I like Clemson's defense Um, I think NC State's a very strong team uh, Louisville's got a great offense. Miami's rebuilding. So I didn't see a playoff candidate there. The Big 12 is even more wide open with, you could argue, five different teams to win that thing. Uh, Oklahoma in a transition. Baylor losing a lot of defenders and skill talent. Uh, so I ultimately went with Utah just given the way they surged at the end of last year. A very proven staff in player development. Um, Morgan Scally, one of the best coordinators on defense. Uh, and like you mentioned, the way they out physical Oregon twice in a row. They smashed them twice. I think that there's enough there that they could run through that and go 12-1. and one. Now, to your point on Michigan, I'm very high on Michigan. I have them six in the country, mm-hmm. and I think they're very close. Uh, one thing that I think I've heard on your show and other Michigan shows and people close to the program saying that has also improved, it's not a, a sexy stat or anything, but the locker room culture, the mm-hmm. team culture uh, is definitely improved. It's night and day, and I think that, that gives Michigan more staying power through transition seasons. Not to call it a transition. I think with eight starters back on offense, there's a lot there. you got the Joe Moore Award offensive line, three starters back an ace center coming in from UVA. Um, so really a lot to like from Michigan. They're really a game away. It's just that we're picking between Ohio State and Michigan. This this year I sided with Ohio State in the, in the forecast. But, um, yeah, a lot of respect for Michigan. Let, let's put it this way. If you put Michigan in the Pac-12 North, I have them as a playoff team. Hmm. Do you – I have – I am projecting an all-Big Ten SEC playoff which is kind of a preview probably of the era we're about to embark upon in the next three to five years in college football. So I am projecting an Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, and Georgia playoff. You're really not that far off from that if you have Michigan number six. I mean, you're you're at least hovering somewhere around the same stratosphere. Um, and ironically, it might be that Utah Florida game that might determine which one of us turns out to be right about this. If Michigan is, if we both have Michigan pegged right, if, if Utah wins that game, then I agree. They would go with the zero or one loss conference champ in that scenario. If they lose that game, which is a very losable game against an SEC team on the road, then, you know, you're looking at a Utah a team that might be a little bit like last year, but. I got to confess, with the with the with the likely end of the traditional Rose Bowl upon us, given what's going on right now with college football expansion, as much as I want to go down there and beat Ohio State for the first time since 2000, I'm not going to be terribly broken up as an old school guy, man. If 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 Michigan gets in the Rose Bowl this year instead, because Brett, I think this might we only might have one or two like old school traditional Rose Bowls left before this thing is radically different. Yeah, and that's really really the, the point this this off season. Really, it's a shame, and I might be in the old fashioned camp here, but um, I just love what makes college football unique, and uh, and that what that is is the in state rivalries, the, the the regional rivalries, the regionality of it, uh, the long standing traditions, all the pageantry around the game, and what we're seeing with each wave of conference realignment, you lose a little bit more of that historic game. Um, you know, a little bit more is ceded to the TV contracts, the TV companies. Uh, and a little bit more becoming NFL junior every year. So it's really a shame. This year really opened a lot of eyes with the USC-UCLA package. And, uh, of course, I'm sure we'll get replies saying, yeah, but the money, the dollars, uh, that's not really my worldview. That's not really my, my value system right now where I'm at. I mean, I'm not a, a conference commission. But I'm not a university executive. So here's a college football uh, aficionado. Some of those passionate about the history of the game. Mm-hmm. I don't really care what the dollars of it. I, I want the, the tradition of it. Uh, reward the fans that love the sport that have made this into the, the beast that it is. Uh, 
uh, not to rant here on Michigan podcast, but uh, as such a historic program that Michigan is, I'm sure there's some sentiment there. Absolutely. Um, you know, on your side. You bet. So tell us, who are you higher on uh, ahead of the market? For me, it's Mississippi State and Air Force. I'm higher on both of them than the market is right now. Um, in fact, I think Air Force is going to be the first service academy team to get the uh, Group of Five bid for the uh, for the New Year Six. And and I I know Mississippi State plays a difficult schedule, but if uh, but I think uh, I think they will get one of Alabama or Georgia at home. I do, uh, particularly Georgia. Uh, if you look at the string of games that Georgia plays before. That Mississippi State game, it's a classic letdown spot. Then you go in there against a, a quirky offense. Uh, what is it, 16, 17 starters coming back? Those are the two teams I am higher on than the rest of the market. What about you? Yeah, real quick with Mississippi State, I agree big time. I'm the only publication out there that have them outside of sixth or seventh in the West. I've got them, uh, in, in quotes, up at fifth place. It's just a rugged division. Yeah. I have them in the top 25. Uh, so I agree with you there. Another team I'll throw in there is BYU. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a team that returns 15 of their top 16 defenders, nine starters on offense. They smoked the Pac-12 last year going 5-0. and um, The thing is, this year their win total was only at seven. If you got it early enough, it's already up to eight or even eight and a half. So I think I was on the right side of that bet about three months ago, uh, thinking that BYU crushes that seven total. Uh, a team really a diamond in the rough. Uh, they're, they're sitting there a win total of two and a half or three wins is Arizona, the Wildcats. And um, this is a team, the second year under Jed Fish. I know they went 1-11 and last year, and, and right away you would throw this bet out the window. But, no, when you look back at their games, they were competitive. Uh, they bring back a ton of experience. They brought in Jaden Delora, the Washington State quarterback, who earned freshman of the year in the Pac-12. Uh, and they also signed a top 25 recruiting class coming off a one-win season. That might be a record. i got to go verify that. But uh, I, think, I think they get three wins for sure, and anything on top of that is a green bet. Who are you lower on than the market, Brett? Right away, a team that I'm lower on would be Wake Forest. Uh, I'm not buying it from them. I think that mm-hmm. it was a historic run last year under Dave Clawson. Uh, my hats are off to what he's built uh, with his claw fence, as they call it. But I think they've hit their ceiling. And um, when you look around their division, everyone else is trending up, surging right. up. When you have Florida State, I love their defense. Louisville's offense I hit on earlier. Clemson, NC State, a lot of tough games. So I'm, I'm selling Wake Forest. And I'm also going to sell USC, who, who you mentioned there being the prohibitive Vegas favorite to win the league. Um, yeah, it might be some great All-American candidates at the skill positions, but hey, you still got to block and tackle, and they have not done that the last five years. So I'm selling USC. Final question for you, brother. Michigan last year, unranked in the preseason. And, you know, when we were trying to come up with reasons to be hopeful, I looked at Michigan's history uh, going back over the last 50 years. And I think I found 12 instances that Michigan, only 12 uh, in 50 years, that Michigan was not in the preseason AP top 25. And in like nine of those seasons, in the, in the other three, they had losing records. But in like nine of them, they were ranked in the final preseason top 15 or higher. And so the Wolverines clearly pulled that off last year from unranked in the preseason to the program's first top five finish in the AP poll this century. It hadn't happened since Brady's senior year when they beat Alabama in the Orange Bowl. Who are we sitting here right now? And we're just thinking there's no way that will happen. But because of schedule, talent base, et cetera, we could be all sitting here gobsmacked uh, in December when they're invited into the playoff and we're like, you know, we we sh- we we probably should have seen this maybe coming a little bit more than we actually did. Who do you think that's most likely to be? That's a really tough one. I mean, that's really the million dollar question because I'm sure you got some pretty nice odds on uh, an, you know, an unranked team making the playoff. Uh, when you go through it, it seems like the you know the AP poll is going to have a lot of them ranked. I mean, a couple that caught my eye that weren't ranked so far was Penn State. Mm-hmm. Uh, they recruit at a at somewhat near a playoff clip. It's mm-hmm. usually top twelve, top mm-hmm. ten. Um, so maybe throw Penn State into that discussion if a couple games break their way. They had five one-score losses last year, usually indicative of a team better than their record showed. Uh, maybe a Penn State. Um, Kansas State is really a wild-card team. Um, they had, they're very veteran and experienced in every position group. They had uh, the lightning rod, Adrian Martinez, who's hot and cold, but uh, has some, some flashes of brilliance, a quarterback, uh, in a very wide-open conference. So, I mean, maybe K-State gets some of those, goes 11-1 and and makes it. Um, the ACC, NC State, uh, I can't even call that a, a surprise. Everyone else caught on, too. I was picking them to win the ACC Atlantic, actually, but it uh, turns out they're ranked pretty high in the preseason by everyone else, too. So 
Um, yeah, that's really hard to do. And, uh, you know, another one, BYU, I don't see them making the playoff, but they should be ranked. I saw they were unranked in the coaches and will likely be unranked in the AP preseason. I got them 15th nationally right now. Yeah, they returned something like 17, 18 starters off a program the last two years. That's been fantastic. Kind of a renaissance for them. Yep. Uh, guys, he's a great follow on Twitter all season and off season at pick six, spell out the word six, pick six previews on Twitter so for some great college football information all year round. But if folks want to get your preview right now in the final weeks here before the season kicks off, Brett, how can they do that? Yeah, thanks so much. It's uh, pick six previews dot com at pick six previews on Twitter. And on the webpage there, you'll see a couple sample teams. You can see what me and Steve are talking about here with the level of depth on each team, the graphics, the stats, uh, some testimonials. We've got the college game day guys, the ACC. You got the guys. bear. I say you got the bear you, giving, you, giving you some props. So there you go, man. That's some respect right there. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Cr- yeah. Chris Fleek of the bear. And even Steve's on there on the testimonial page for a couple seasons ago. One of the first to discover the book. So thanks again. And uh, like we said, this year it is the first time with a hard copy. So. If you put the hard copy order in, you're also emailed a digital right away. So for those three days while it's in, in process and being shipped uh, USPS-wise, you have access to the book, too. So uh, really excited to go hard copy this year. I think it's uh, an important thing to have when you're doing preseason previews. Great work, brother. Always good to have you back on the show as well. All right. God bless. Enjoy the season. Yeah, good luck, Michigan. It's a very passionate base. It's been great interacting with so many of you, and, uh, and good luck this year. You bet, man. Great work. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you, what is Michigan's next most difficult game this fall after Ohio State? And a majority of you agree with me. 54.6% said at Iowa. 32.4% said Michigan State at home. 13% of you agreed with what you heard earlier this episode from Mark Rogers, where he had Penn State as Michigan's second most difficult game. That brings us to this week's feedback of the week. And it comes from Ben Keller, who says, this Steve guy, I think he's referring to me, has completely gone crazy. We all know Jim Harbaugh is his favorite player of all time, yet he bitched and cried about how bad he was for years. And because he because of one win now, he believes Michigan is an elite program again. LOL, this video will definitely get a thumbs down. Your grammar, Ben, gets a thumbs down. No periods? Not even a comma, bruh? You have an impressive breath capacity. And all I have done... Yes, I have taken all of those positions. <laughs> I have to own it. That part is true. But all I have done is accurately reflected the lament, the topsy-turvy lament of what it is meant to be a Michigan fan here in the last decade or so. So don't blame me. I'm a victim. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, five-star review, share, etc. Help us find more Michigan fans just like you and let everybody else know that uh, you appreciate what we try to do here each and every week on Michigan Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, at Michigan Podcast. Keep up to date about what we think about all things maize and blue in between episodes as well. That'll do it for another week. Until the next time here on Michigan Podcast, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.